this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. My name is Hannah. I'm the EMPGY2 here at Southwest General, which is located in Middleburg Heights, Ohio, right outside Cleveland. So here are some abbreviations that you may see throughout the presentation and can reference later on if need be. Our objectives for today will review cryoprecipitates mechanism and current place in therapy for trauma protocols, actually discuss the cryostat 2 trial and then analyze the results of the trial and then discuss the implication of cryoprecipitate based on the results that we will share. So what is cryoprecipitate? It's a portion of plasma that's rich in clotting factors, specifically fibrinogen factor 7 and factor 13, and then von Willebrand factor. It can help slow or stop the bleeding, but the biggest thing is that's if a patient is has depletion of fibrinogen and these other factors. So that's going to kind of play a big role in how this study implicates into current practice. Just to break down how cryo is actually withdrawn, it's basically the last thing that comes out of a plasma transfusion. So we spin it down to our red blood cells and our platelets, and then our plasma, and then our FFP gets frozen, and anything left is also our cryoprecipitate. So it's basically the frozen precipitate of our FFP. Right now, cryo is specifically for patients that we may know have von Willebrand disease, hemophilia A, or any bleeding associated with antiplatelet therapy. The standard massive hemorrhage protocol dosing is two pools or four grams of cryo. So this is kind of where cryo, we're not really sure where it stands because in a trauma, we don't have the entire backstory. But for pharmacists specifically, antiplatelet therapy is where we may be able to make the recommendation to throw on cryo if needed. So there's been a couple trials that have already looked at cryo, and these ones specifically focus on the time to administer cryo. Reason being, just like FFP, it is frozen. So before administration, we have to thaw it. So the question was, how quick can we get this, the cryo to a patient if needed? And that's specifically what these trials looked at, specifically the cryostat one trial that took place in 2015. So this study was just trying to see, can we administer cryo within 90 minutes of admission to a hospital if a patient came in and an MHP needed to be started? It was an unblinded randomized control trial that took place in UK trauma patients that were at least 16 years or older and also had active bleeding. The intervention group was standard of care plus two pools of cryo within that 90 minutes of admission. So you will see the standard of care discussed later on in the cryostat 2 trial. This trial only had 44 patients, 22 in standard and 21 in the cryo group. 85% of the cryo patients met the primary outcome with a mean time of 60 minutes. So yes, this trial said that we can administer cryo within 90 minutes of a patient presenting to the ER. And then in 2018, the EFIT-1 trial came out. And this was looking at seeing if we can administer cryo within 45 minutes of admission. It was a blinded randomized placebo-controlled trial. This one was standard plus six grams of fibrinogen concentrate or cryo plus the standard MHP in placebo. This study concluded that based off of this patient population, they could not administer the cryo within 45 minutes of, of admission. And then the last uh, trial before getting into the cryo step two was the Flynn tick trial that took place in 2021. So this study assessed the clot stability reflected by maximum clot firmness or an assay before the before and after administration. So this actually looked at whether cryo helped stabilize the clots. It was a prospective randomized placebo controlled double blinded international clinical trial. Our groups either received fibrinogen, the concentrate or cryo or placebo pre-hospital at the scene or during transportation. So this is even prior to arrival to an ER. The trial concluded that early fibrinogen concentrate administration is feasible in complex and time-sensitive environment in a pre-hospital setting. Now, moving on to the actual trial, the CryoStat 2 trial, 
which was an interventional, randomized, open-label, parallel group controlled international multi-center trial. The study wanted to assess whether survival could be improved by administering a her- an early and empirical high dose of cryo to all patients with trauma that required activation of a major hemorrhage protocol. The primary outcome for cryostat 2 is all-cause mortality in 28 days. So this is the first trial after the previous three that was already discussed that actually looked at all-cause mortality. Secondary outcomes included all-cause mortality at 6, 24, 6 and 24 hours, 6 and 12 months, transfusion requirements at 24 hours, our critical care and overall stay outcomes, destination at discharge, whether they were able to go home or whether they had to go to rehabs, quality of life, and then our Glasgow Glasgow outcomes uh, scale scores at discharge or at 28 days. For safety outcomes, we just looked at the symptomatic venous or arterial thrombotic events up to 28 days or until the patient was discharged, whatever came first. So looking at our baseline patient characteristics, I wanted to point out first our age, our median age was about 40 years old in both groups. And then only about 10% of patients were greater than 70 years old. So this is different for our Southwest population here. We see more of our geriatric patients than our younger patients. And then also TXA or tranexamic acid has been a huge topic in the ER world. So I also just wanted to address how many patients got TXA along with the intervention groups. So what patients were included in this trial? For patients that came in that we didn't have any background, as long as the physician judged them to be an adult at the time of screening, so if patients didn't have any ID on them and they look to be about 16 years or older, they could be included. They must have sustained a severe injury, had to have an active hemorrhage that required the activation of an MHP, a systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, and then started to receive at least one unit of any blood component, whether that's red blood cells, plasma, or FFPs. Exclusion criteria was pretty broad. The patient had to, couldn't be being transferred from another hospital to the facility in which the trial was taking place. Um, if the injuries were incompatible with life, the patient was, in, was excluded, and that was assessed by the trauma team leader. And then three hours elapsing from the time of injury to the time of cryo administration. Our treatment groups, both groups received the standard treatment. So we saw this also being used in our previous trial. This was according to the hospital's local MHP. So it wasn't necessarily standard throughout the patients. It was based off the hospitals that were included in this study, what they already used for the MHP with a balanced empirical ration of red blood cells and fresh frozen plasma. So both groups got at least the standard care. Our intervention group also received an additional three pools of cryo on top of the hospital's standard MHP protocol. There were about 1,600 total patients randomized in this trial, 805 in the standard care group, and 799 in our interventional group, so pretty even throughout. However, 73 patients were lost due to missing primary outcome um, when they did the chart reviews. So that took our total participants down to 1,531 in our attention, intention to treat group. Cryo was administered 665 out of the 785 patients in the intervention group, and then 256 out of 795 patients in the standard group. 170 patients were excluded from our per protocol cohort for multiple reasons, either no longer requiring blood transfusions by the time cryo was considered, dying within that 90 minutes of arrival, and then being randomized in error. The study did provide a sample size calculation that was very similar and originated from the Cryostat 1 trial. They used a 90% power to detect that 28-day all-cause mortality in an initial blinded analysis after the first 200 patients have been recruited and followed up in 20 days. Once they recruited and followed up, they allowed they assess reassess sample size requirements, which changed to meet a pre-specified power of 1,530 patients in total. Our statistics included analysis with mixed logistic regression model for our primary outcome, and then our survival rates after 28 days were estimated either using the Kaplan-Meier method and then further compared using our Cox proportional hazard regression model. 
Again, our primary outcome, we were looking at all-cause mortality at 28 days. About 25% of patients in the cryo group met that primary outcome, and about 26 patients in our standard of care group met our primary outcome. Mortality was similar across the two groups at our 6 and 24 hours. This just looks at the mortality comparing our groups and the curve to assess how many patients and the percentage of patients who passed away given whichever group they were a part of. Our primary outcomes, we had our intention to treat population and then our per protocol population. So 25, again, 25% met our primary outcome, 23% in the per protocol, and then 26 to 22 intention to treat to per protocol. So pretty even across both groups and both interventions. For secondary outcomes listed in the previous slides, there were no observed differences between our study groups for the 24-hour transfusion requirements, critical care or hospital length of stay, the destination at discharge, and the GCS score at 28 days or discharge as well. Discussing the safety outcomes, again, there was no difference seen between our two groups. So what of the study? Strengths, it was, it included a very acute patient population, which I think is important, It was a randomized nature. It had a pretty decent population size. And then our baseline patient characteristics were pretty similar between our two groups. However, with the limitations of rapid delivery requirements, that led to an overlap between the two study groups. I also think it's important to point out that in some of the locations that this trial took place in, cryo was already included in their massive hemorrhage protocol And in those protocols, it was standard of like two pools on top of the additional four pools that we were looking at for this study. So it's kind of hard to really compare considering some people got cryo regardless of what group they were in. For cryo specifically, like I discussed at the beginning, it's more specific to fibrinogen. And in some cases, we don't really know the efficacy of it because we aren't able to get fibrinogen levels before we need to administer our MHP. Here at Southwest, that is not a standard lab that we would get for our trauma patients. It is something that we could add on, but again, that would take time to get back, making the decision of whether cryo would be useful or not. However, if it was an antiplatelet therapy, that would be discussed earlier on because we know that that would be a risk factor. And then lastly, a majority of the sites were in the UK, just due to the extensive approval requirements in the US. So that's kind of lacking the ability to look at it from a U.S. standpoint, just the standard of care is different between the U.K. and U.S. So I think that's also important to point out. The authors concluded that among patients with bleeding and trauma who require activation of a massive hemorrhage protocol, the addition of early empirical high-dose cryo to, cryo to the standard of care did not improve the all-cause 28-day mortality, which was evident by our percentages of patients that met our primary outcome addressed in the previous slides. I don't think this is going to alter our practice. We do not include cryo in our massive hemorrhage protocol here. It is something that we can get if needed, and it has been suggested a couple of times. But when we establish our MHP, cryo is not a part of that. Along with that, we don't typically get a fibrinogen level. So cryo doesn't really come into play, like I said, unless we know the patient is on antiplatelet or they have the other disease states that that were mentioned ahead of time. Which kind of leads me to the second point. This may be useful in certain populations, but in most cases, we don't necessarily have the full story of on the patient. If the patient's never been to your hospital before, you're not able to access their external medication records to see if antiplatelet therapy is on board, not able to access outside records. There's just a lot of factors that in this setting, we don't necessarily know the full story. I don't think administering cryo and having it a part of the MHP would necessarily cause harm, but in terms of altering an MHP to include cryo, if it's not already included, I don't think this study points you one way or another. And at this time, what questions can I answer? If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. 
The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.